Hello and welcome to ATP Report. I'm Barry Nussbaum. Before we bring on a very special guest, I want to remind all of you out in ATP land, if you haven't done so already, please take out your cell phone, do us a favor, and text the message TRUTH, T-R-U-T-H, and send it to 88202, push send. You'll be signed up for free in about three seconds for all of our ATP content. It'll come right to the palm of your hand in your cell phone, absolutely free. So I've got a surprise for you. Let me bring on Annie Cyrus, National Director of ATP and former child bride survivor from Iran to talk about Islam with me today. This is gonna be a good one. Hi, Annie. Hi, Barry. Yes, it's going to be a tragic one, but a good one. So let's just jump into it. You did a show the other day uh, on your radio that has gotten some incredible responses, and we thought it would be the best thing to follow up with you and I together because this is really important news that our viewers need to understand its significance. So let's talk about it. The Senate just confirmed a lifetime appointment for a Pakistani American Muslim federal judge. Who is he? And what can you tell me about him? Well, that's a good question. I can't tell you exactly who he is because there's just so far you can go back reading about him. Some very the stops, but that's a different uh, uh, issue with him. He is Judge Qureshi. He was born in America to a Pakistani family, which are practicing Muslim, and he was raised a Muslim, and he practices Mus Islam, and he was very proud to announce the history he made by being the first Muslim judge. Now, let me tell you why I have a problem with that, because if being a federal judge comes secondary as pride and being a muslim is your first priority to be happy about then you're telling me that you are very proud of your islamic faith that's well, my very big very first red flag with him well let me jump into the conflict you're referring to because i guarantee the majority of people watching today don't understand that conflict you're referring to as I understand it, Allah and Muhammad are quoted as saying that followers of Islam cannot follow the laws or instructions of the non-believers if those instructions or law contradict Sharia. So question one, Annie, is that true? And question two, which is much more important, what will this new judge do when the American laws he is sworn to uphold and interpret contradict his personal, religious, and as I understand it, non-negotiable instructions. It's very correct. Yes, you know me. Let, me. let me bring up Quran and Hadith. Many verses, many Hadith, but I'm going to just give you one because we don't have too much time. You open Quran, chapter 33, and very first verse, right there it says, O Prophet, be afraid or fear Allah and do not, do not obey the disbelievers and hypocrites. Well, Allah is all knowing and wise. Right there. Who are the disbelievers? Non Muslims. Now, if our audience wants to understand why disbelievers are non Muslims, they can go to American Truth Project.org, look up Annie Cyrus. I've done many videos explaining it. Then we go to Hadith where Muhammad said, Narrated by Abdullah, Prophet Muhammad said, a Muslim must obey his leader, the law of the land and the rules, unless those rules are against Allah's rules. If any of those laws and rules creates disobedience toward Allah, then that Muslim should not obey the leader. And that one is on Al-Bukhari, Book of Judgment, which is book 88, Hadith number 258. Put those two together. No matter who you are, if you claim to be a Muslim, you should not follow any laws that goes against Allah and Muhammad, which is Sharia. Answer your second question. 
There are two possible scenarios. Judge Qureshi will follow Sharia and disobey our constitution. Scenario number two, he will follow our constitution and earn himself a fatwa to be killed under law of Sharia. That second answer, I mean, it sounds so silly, but it's true, anticipated my next question. And I was gonna ask you, explain why this judge has no choice but not to follow US law. He's got a death penalty hanging over his head. Can you explain what that means and why it's there in Sharia that could be in the back of this judge's mind if he has to render a decision where he's in conflict, Sharia, US Constitution, oh my God, which way do I go? Well, I'll tell you what, before I answer that, Barry, let me say this. You said if there is a conflict. I guarantee you there will be conflict because here are very few of hundreds of possible conflicts. Under Islam, under Sharia, there is no such a thing as freedom of religion. Our First Amendment gives us freedom of religion. Right there, conflict. If this judge is ever in a position to make a judgment between a Muslim and a non-Muslim by Sharia, he has to side with the Muslim. That goes against our constitution and that is discrimination. If he ever has to make a judgment between a Sharia, uh, uh, Islamic law being Sharia, that applies to freedom of press, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, or anything that would say or discriminate against Muhammad and Islam, he will have no choice but to side with Sharia. If he doesn't, in Quran and on the Hadith, it says, if any Muslim ever turn their back to Allah, Muhammad, and Sharia, they shall be killed. The exact term, <coughs> excuse me, the exact term is to be beheaded. The punishment in Quran for someone who turns away from Islam is beheading. Lovely. Well, now let's get heavy with a history lesson about my favorite American president, Thomas Jefferson. And this is really important because I'm going to tie it together with one of your favorite new people, Rashida Tlaib. In 1786, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson met with the Arab diplomats from Tunisia who were in the process of waging war against the brand new American country. They would seize ships, grab the sailors, imprison the ones that lived and sell them back to the United States or sell them into slavery. So that's how they made a living. And the United States, before it launched a war on the Barbary pirates, that's what they were called. They met with the ambassador and wanted to know why they were doing this. Thomas Jefferson just could not understand why they would be attacking a country that had done nothing to him. And, and Jefferson wrote extensively about this. He just couldn't understand it. So what happened? Well, the ambassador basically told Jefferson it's their duty under Islam as being instructed by Sharia to wage war on all of mankind who don't believe. In other words, they were sinners and it was their right and duty to make war upon them wherever they could be found and quote, make slaves of all they could take prisoners. And every Muslim who was slain in battle was sure to go to paradise. So my first question, that was 1786. We're in 2021. Does Islam still believe what that ambassador told Thomas Jefferson? I do you want better, Barry. Since 1400 years ago, Islam is the same. 1400 years ago, Muhammad told his army of Muslims that we're going to walk through Medina and we're going to walk through Mecca and anyone who's not a Muslim, who's not willing to convert to Islam, we will kill them, or we take their wives and daughters and sex as slaves, we take their properties and monies, and we're gonna make them convert to Islam. 1400 years ago, 400 years ago, four days ago, four minutes ago, 
and 400 years from today, it's going to be the same. Well, here's the big question of the day. I think I know what you're going to say, but I have to ask it for our audience. Rashida Tlaib is very vocal and upfront about the fact she is not a Christian. She's a practicing Muslim. When she took the oath of office to be a United States Congresswoman, she did not take the oath on the Bible, but she took the, the oath on the Quran and not just any Quran. She took the oath on Thomas Jefferson's Quran. What Rashida Tlaib did not understand because she apparently is not a historical um, person or has no value with history of the United States is the reason Thomas Jefferson kept the Quran on his desk was he felt that this was an enemy of the new country that unless they rejected the Quran would never be Americans. So what does it mean when Talib swears in on the Quran instead of the Bible? Is it because she's really making a statement that that's where her loyalties lie? Well, before I directly answer you, which you know, we have the same answer. When you said Talib is not a big fan of history, I would like to add something. Rashida Talib is a huge fan of made up history. If she didn't know anything about history, I wouldn't mind. But she's a big fan of made up history that she spread every day. And you know what I'm referring to? A Palestine history that is made up. That's a different note. Yes, Rashida Talib is very openly practicing Muslim, which I might add, side note people, if Rashida Talib lived in an actual Islamic country, she would be hung because she doesn't wear the hijab and she speaks loudly. Both crimes under Sharia to be punished. Anyhow, she specifically took the oath on that Quran for two reasons. One, yes, she is going to obey Sharia regardless. She has done it to this day, Barry. Every time she said no to something was because it was anti-Islam. Every time she tried to push in a new law, it's pro-Sharia. And I think the other part of it was actually to disrespect our history by taking an oath on a Quran that was kept in that library to remind us what we're not supposed to do. And we ended up exactly doing that very wrong thing, which was giving power to Islamic Sharia practicing people who hate us and our constitution ordered by their prophet and their Allah. Well, that explains a lot because so many people cannot figure out why she just seems to hate America and why she seems to have a different agenda. And I think you just put your finger on it. It's because she looks to another guide than we do. We have the United States Constitution. She has the Quran. Exactly. And if anybody would ever listen to me or you, Barry, and read the Quran, they would see that more than 51% of Quran is explanation on how to deal with non-Muslims. And here are the ways you deal with them in Quran. Make them second class citizen and bury them under Islamic taxes until they don't have the money to pay anymore. Then give them an option of convert. If they don't, kill them. That is how the Quran is. 51% of the Quran. Well, it explains a lot, and it's an explanation that I think is the underlying cause for her, what seems to be irrational statements on a daily basis and the pushing of a narrative that I think she's making up as she goes along. Annie, thanks so much for coming on. We've got to continue this discussion. There's so much we need to educate people on and tying it together with current political events that make no sense all of a sudden start making sense. And it's not good news, but we need to be arming our people with the knowledge because knowledge is power and ignorance of this, the underlying motivation for people that don't like you, don't like me, don't like America, and certainly don't like our way of life. Now it makes more sense. For those of you out there in ATP land, I want to admonish you one more time, please sign up. 
Get all of Annie Cyrus and me and everybody else, all of our guests for free on your phone, simply texting the word truth to 88202. For Annie Cyrus, I'm Barry Newsbaum. Thanks for joining us on ATP Report. 